Well, hi, everybody. I'm Frank Gladstone from CIFA Hollywood. And today we're having a conversation with the folks at Baobab Studios. And they just turned five years old, I think. And so we have there Maureen Fan. Hello, Maureen. And then we have Eric Darnell and Larry Cutler. All of you are founders. Is that correct? You founded this on your own? Was it, was it, I'd like to know because it's a, you're an unusual studio in a way and you focus on a certain thing, which we'll talk about, but how did this all come together? How did you guys meet? meet? And how did somebody, was somebody having a, a, a good day or, or, or a lot of scotch and came up with the idea? What was it? Well, uh, I wanted to start an animation studio by in my entire life um, and majored basically in computer science, art and psychology so I could do it. <laughs> but my immigrant parents told me I'd be poor and destitute if I followed my dreams in animation. So um, I didn't go <laughs> into it as, a, but it's my lifelong dream because I love animation. It is, uh, it brings out your sense of wonder. For me, it brings me back to that five-year-old sense of self where I thought anything was possible. And as an adult, I feel we all need more of that, right? When we grow older, we conform to societal values of fame, money, fortune, beauty. And when we play or watch animation, it brings us back to that childlike sense of wonder where we think we're invincible and we have so much more potential. Mm -hmm. And so I've always wanted to, to do an animation studio. And um, I had, uh, when VR first came out, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the perfect chance because I wasn't gonna go create a studio to compete against like Pixar or Disney without a ton of money or unfair distribution advantage. So, um, but with VR, it was great because no one has an advantage because it's technological disruption. So I asked my mentor, Glenn Entis, who's the co-founder of PDI, which DreamWorks acquired, if he knew of any directors. And he introduced me to Eric Darnell, who um, is on here, who uh, co-directed all the Madagascar films, all four of them, as well as uh, Ants and DreamWorks' first ever CG animated film, and happens to be the second highest grossing box office animation writer director of all time. Is that um, true? I have to say that. Yes. What? We actually went and like added them all up, but Eric won't say that. So I have to say that for him. And then um, I was really lucky uh, to be able to get Eric. And then Larry, um, I had emailed when I was deciding whether or not to pursue an MBA. Um, I emailed everyone in the Stanford alumni database for advice. And he was one of the few who responded and we kept in touch ever since then. And I ran into him right after meeting with Eric and we're like, let's start a company. And so we just did it within um, two months. We, we formed together, we raised funds and made a demo and it was glorious. So we've been around for five years now and it's thrilling every day that we get to wake up every single day and innovate in animation. And the awesome part is you know, because we're, our focus is a lot on interactive animation that no one really knows what they're doing. We're working in game engine. Um, and it's exciting because it feels like the new frontier. There's animation, which I love, but it's taking, it's innovating in animation, right? And that's mm -hmm. exciting because there's totally a new set of problems to solve. So we're really excited. And the mission of the company is to inspire the world to dream by bringing out your sense of wonder, make you matter. So it's the reason why I love animation. It's it's the mission statement. But that last part, make you matter, really matters to us because we are all about making you part, the audience part of the story so that the characters matter to you, you matter to the characters and you matter to the story. So while this very um, low key person, uh, Maureen got in touch with you, what did you think guys? Did you go, um, uh, it's crazy town or did you go i think this is a really great idea or a little of both well i really respect glenn entis he's been a friend of mine ever since i i worked at pdi back in the early 90s and i think that's when i was, met you actually eric was about you were i think you were still at pdi at the time probably yeah i mean it, it was um my first real job i just graduated from the experimental animation program at cal arts at that time computers were in the experimental category, <laughs> um, not anymore. But um, yeah, and you know, PDI was a great company, and Glenn was a great leader, and um, he's just a super smart person. Anyway, so when he um, said, "I have somebody for you to meet with, who's interested in starting a VR company," I had left DreamWorks a couple months before. 
um, having finished the Penguins movie and kind of looking for something different to do mm -hmm. in my career after um, after the films that I directed at DreamWorks. And so I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I've always been a fan of 3D, whatever that means. You know, my grandfather had one of those, you know, things where you put the cards in and, and you bring mm -hmm. it into focus. And, um, and, you know, I had my own, 60s version of that with the Viewmaster when I was a kid growing up and I would just look at this stuff forever. So when I saw computer animation for the first time and saw, I also loved animation. I was up, you know, at 6 a.m. I, I grew up in Kansas. So if you got up at 6 a.m., you know, the cartoons started at 6.30. So I would get my like bowl of Cheerios and I'd turn on the farm report which was the first show at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning and like get, learn about corn prices while I waited for Casper the Friendly Ghost or something to come on. Right. And um, so those two things together, you know, animation and 3D and, and what computers offered in, in that world was just really um, something that really attracted me. And I didn't know anything about VR. I hadn't put a headset on, but Marine brought a headset to our first meeting and I put it on and it was a simple thing. I, just an underwater scene with some turtles swimming by or something. And, you know, it just blew me away. So that combined with, um, you know, Marine's pedigree and, um, and then Larry coming on, on board too. It's sort of like, we felt like we kind of had the three legs of the bilk stool in a way, you know, we had Marine and all of her experience being an executive at Zynga and Larry with his um, massive experience both at uh, Pixar and DreamWorks, where at DreamWorks he was heading up all the, the character tech development across the entire studio um, as a judge for the technical Oscars. And so we've got it all kind of, we hope we have everything inside the package. So anyway, that was great. But Larry, I, you like saw Marine at like a, Chinese yeah, New Year's festival or something, right? It's, it's kind of funny. Like serendipity plays a large part in in any of these uh, endeavors coming together. And you know, you know, for me, what's wild is that I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this, but but I was doing as a grad student at Stanford, I was doing kind of early VR research, and so this was in like the mid '90s, and it was you know like we had like uh, these big head mount head mounted displays where we taped like these magnetic trackers to them. And then we had like pinch gloves and styluses and everything was corded and it was like super like futuristic. And it was all running on hundreds of thousands of dollars of SGI computer that, you know, research money. And, and so like, I did see the promise of VR 20, 25 years ago, you know, in the mid nineties. And at the same time, it was so clear that it was not ready for prime time just because, you know, like you had to like recalibrate every like hour. And it was just, it, you know, when it, it, when it worked, it was magical, but it worked like 10% of the time. Right. And so, um, so I was, you know, like lucky enough to, to go to Pixar kind of in those early days. Cause a lot of people at, at Stanford and the graphics group ended up going to Pixar working on Toy Story. And, you know, we worked on some of the early films there. And in the back of my mind, you know, it's always been playing like, well, when will this VR thing happen? Like, I can't really wait for, you know, for that to come about. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden these uh, Oculus Rift prototypes came out and, and a lot of my coworkers at DreamWorks were super, super excited about it because, you know, they're all really into this stuff. And I, you know, similar to Eric, put on a headset at a party and, you know, maybe after a cocktail or two, you put the headset on and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And what's funny is it was like the lamest demo you could ever think of. Like you're sitting in a movie theater <laughs> with movie seats, you're watching a movie on TV. And I came out and that was like, this is amazing. They've solved all the problems. It was only like a, a day later where I was like, wow, if I, I, I could not think of a lamer VR demo to do, but it totally worked. And, and so I, I was at another startup. So I, you know, I, I was kind of getting the flavor of being at a small organization as opposed to like the big massive, you know, DreamWorks engine or Disney engine. Um, and my, my daughter was fan dancing. Uh, it, she was in elementary school in the Chinese New Year parade in San Francisco, which is literally like millions of people. Like it's a big Chinese New Year parade for, yeah. for the United States. And I randomly ran into Marine, who you know we had kept in touch, but hadn't seen each other in you know in years. And the first thing she says to me is, "Hey, I'm thinking of leaving Zynga and starting up a VR company." And I had like literally been thinking along those lines, like, "Hey, 
I want this is like a match of animation, entertainment, and VR is like there's something there. Like I want to actually pursue that. I don't really haven't thought through how to go about doing that. And you know, and then we started talking. I was like, well, the only way you would start a next generation studio is with an amazing creative. And of course, Marine's like, well, I've already thought of that. Like I've already talked to Eric, you know, who I knew from DreamWorks, even though ironically, we had never worked together. So it would have been really helpful if I had worked on his films, then we would have this rapport, but. Yeah, then you might not have joined the company. Yeah, then I would never have joined. It would have been like, dude, dude <laughs> that guy. that <laughs> guy? No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, and so, you know, here we are today, five, five, five plus years later and, and still going. <laughs> uh, by the way, Eric, my cereal of choice was sugar pops on Saturday morning, not Cheerios. That's my, my preference. And, uh, it just depended on what phase my mom was yeah. in, in terms of like <laughs> healthiness, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we'd go back, we'd go between Quisp and Quake to Rice Krispies and Cheerios or whatever. Well, so you started this five years, well, a little more than five years ago now, right? You've done how many projects all together? How many, how many, <laughs> six of them? And, um, you know, VR is, is still kind of a baby in the, in the industry. I'm looking for more stuff to do. Uh, but the, one of the things, I, I know the pipeline's somewhat different, but I don't know how different it is. Does it affect the, the general uh, scheduling of the show? What is it about VR in, in so many words that's, uh, that's different or similar to a regular good old animation pipeline? It's an excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, in in reality, uh, it's actually quite different. And we, I think we, when we started the company, we actually had a, we, we sort of figured it'd be just like creating a film, but in 360, you know, I think, and it would be like, it was like, oh my God, it'll be so amazing because you're actually placing you directly in the story, you're there. Um, but what we didn't realize is that by placing you in the story, not only are you connected to the characters and to the world around you but you can actually like we could give you a role to play like you could you you could be part of the story like because we're we're running everything in real time the characters can actually react to you they could acknowledge your presence and you could build a relationship with them and so the fact that all of this is happening in real time is fundamentally different and kind of an amalgam of like a film pipeline and a game pipeline. And so right. when we started Baobab, we realized that we were going to have to build a whole new tool set and pipeline to tell these stories. And so on Invasion, we started what became our storyteller pipeline, where basically for us, it, it was, could we create an empathetic character that had that like feature film Pixar quality character running in a game engine that reacts to you? Like, could we do that? And we hadn't seen that you know in any of the projects we had looked at e either in games or vr because typically you have these very kind of dead characters that don't you don't really see that illusion of life that we've spent so much time handcrafting in straight ahead animation in a feature film mm -hmm. but that like renders overnight you know at a render farm and and uh you know there's no obviously responsiveness and so we wanted to see could we crack that could we actually capture all those subtle emotions could we capture that you know sort of exaggerated poses that eric loves you know in his stories with lots of squash and stretch and and um and that you know animated performance that you just you, you know like you know that there's intention and thought behind a character's eyes and so that was kind of the first leg of building out Storyteller was on Invasion, where we really proved to ourselves that we could create a character, in this case, Chloe, that audiences just fell in love with. And since then, over the last five years, we've been building up this tool set to support you know, a really broad range of projects. And we've had to dive really deeply into character AI, where we have characters that are really fundamentally uh, completely responsive to what you're doing and procedurally generated and yet you still feel like you're looking at a little pork bun, you know, alien, for example. Um, or we've had to create, you know, a tool set just to be able to take our VR experiences and then create a more traditional cinematic film version so that, you know, so that as broad an audience as possible can see it. Right. Um, and that's what you had to do for, for um, us this year is create a, 
yeah and so like, well, I like finally referred to it as a flat version but, uh, <laughs> yeah well we, we 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 for a while called it our pancake tool set because it's basically yeah. like flattening but you know uh, i gotta say I, I i just watched the new one uh, uh the rough cut and um it works i mean i realized that i was sasha you know and uh, and this person's reacting to me and i'm now it's it, it was just a, it wasn't a vr i couldn't interact with them but but i i got it uh, it, it's fine, yeah. you know. It, it's a, it's a, it's a good idea. You know, and I, I think with with the 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 kind of flat version of Baba Yaga, one of the the things that really has shown kind of the evolution of our storyteller platform from five years ago to now, is that we were actually Eric very early on in the two D processes had a really you know sort of innovative way of thinking about how the cinematography would work in order to support that kind of first personal emotional POV from Sasha's vantage point. And so he wanted to do all the cinematography himself. And so we actually built a tool set that allowed Eric to actually, you know, work in the game engine, literally work in VR to actually do all of the cinematography. So we ultimately got to a point where the tool set was at least palatable enough that you know, our own director who hadn't animated in a long time could actually utilize the tools and actually basically handheld shoot the footage and the camera camera angles himself. Yeah, it was so well. It's like actually, it's like a live action shoot with a steady cam. You know, I you you pick this camera up, you see the the you know the the view screen right in front of you like you would on a camera. You've got focal length and. Um, uh, you know, that you can adjust for and, and you can adjust the angle on the screen so that you can get the camera really low. And, and it, it's like, it's just like shooting a movie in the real world. And it was, it was astonishing. And of course, all those variables, like, you know, the damp damping on the set, on the steady camera and all those things are all adjustable too. So you can get a lot of nuance in how you do things. And for me, like Larry said, the idea is to, um, Think of it not as a literal point of view, but but an emotional point of view. So, an, an example is like, you know, if you're if you're in a room and suddenly somebody walks in and points a gun at your face, well, like that's the most important thing right then for you. Everything else falls away. All you see is the end of that gun and the eyes of that person behind the gun as you're wondering, well, are they going to pull the trigger or not? So, we can like suddenly snap into something like that and capture an emotional perspective and, and not necessarily a literal perspective. And so it was really kind of a, a fun challenge to sort of find those places where we could break literal point of view and it wouldn't be jarring or confusing for, um, for the audience. So hopefully we succeeded. Well, the other issue that, you know, one of the arguments about VR is, oh, it's, uh, you just go in and you look around a lot. You know, it's a big room, oh, look at that, well, I can look behind me. And, and that becomes kind of a, a gimmick in, in a way it's not a, it, it helps the storytelling kind of, but it also can detract from it. So how do you approach um, the, because what, because the, the issue is telling a story that the audience now becomes a member of, uh, kind of like a game, but it's also a, a literal story, a linear story that has a beginning, middle and end. Uh, right. How do, you, yeah. how do you deal with that? And, and waves get a little, you know, how do you deal with the idea of, oh, I'm just going to, I remember the first time I did VR, I was looking over here and all the stuff was happening over there. I was just interested in the bookcase, you know, so. Well, you know, somebody asked me one time, like, what is it like to leave traditional filmmaking and no longer have the tools that you need to actually direct the content you're creating? And, you know, my answer was, I'm still directing the content I'm creating. I just have different tools at my disposal. So my job as a director, if you translate to like, establishing what the viewer is going to be looking at is my job is to inspire the viewer to look exact way back up. My job is to inspire the viewer to make the completely free choice to look exactly where I want them to look when I want them to look there. And so there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can have another character that's on screen. So they go, Oh, what's that? And then you look where they look, or you can have a sound that pulls your attention or, and then once you pull their attention there, you give them, you, you make it worth their while. Like, oh my God, I'm not going to look away from this. I can't look away from this. This is really interesting. So there's a lot of ways that you can sort of design an experience where the viewer is actually doing what you kind of want them to do, even though it's in their mind, it's their decision to do it. 
And there's a lot of tricks. Like I say sound, but sometimes the literal sound of something that's sort of like a car that's coming at you down the road might be too quiet. So you put that sound in their ear louder than it should be. And that gets their attention. And then they look over and they see the car is actually farther away, but they don't care because when they heard the sound, they weren't, oh, you know, they weren't there yet analyzing like exactly where it, what it was or how far away it is. And so you can actually sort of cheat things like that and, and make things have a bigger impact than they might normally if, you know, if you were being literal about stuff like that. Um, but, and I also think that, you know, this idea that having, creating characters that, that really feel like they're connecting with you, like even on our first piece, when that bunny hops out and joins you on the ice of that frozen lake, I didn't know what to expect. But when the bunny makes eye contact with people, and when we were demoing it for the first time, people were like, they were dancing with the bunny, they were trying to pet it, they were laughing, they were doing all these things you'd never do in a movie theater. And, and so there's something really, really powerful about that kind of communication. I mean, eye contact is like a basic and yet profound way that we communicate with each other, even our own pets. And, um, and you can do that. It, even if the person is like taking a step to the left or to the right or walked over to that part of the room, the character can find them and make that eye contact that you need to have happen. And once you start developing that relationship with the character and you're engaged with the character, you want to look at the character. You want to see what they're doing next. You want to see how you can maybe help um, get, you know, help them get what they want or what they need, that sort of thing. And you stay engaged that way. Maureen, um, you are... Um... It's very ambitious to start an animation studio just because you want to, uh, but you did have the business experience to do that. But the creative experience, you know, sometimes there's a, that tightrope we all walk, uh, walk between commerce and art. And, um, and, but your studio, as you said in, in, the, in the first part of this talk, was all about telling stories. What you want to do is tell stories that people can be involved in and, and go to that place that they were when they were um, um, open. So how do you choose the stories? Who chooses? Is it a community thing? Do you come in and say, here's the next story? Or I mean, what happens there? Well, um, first, we believe that a great story and great characters transcend any individual medium. So while we are best known for VR, there's will be news coming out soon about, well, there was already news in the beginning about how um, Invasion, how we partnered with Roth Kirschenbaum Films who did Snow White, uh, Maleficent, Alice in Wonderland to turn Invasion into a feature film. But we have additional series to announce um, mm -hmm. and partnerships on features, series, as well as books coming out. But in terms of coming out with a story, a lot of them come from Eric. So it's Matt, he's magical. Um, even with a, with our starting the studio within the first few months, I believe he had already had like 13 treatments or scripts in various stages. And it was just so exciting for me to just be to read through all of them. And they were just so amazing. So Eric is constantly coming up with amazing new IP. And for the um, films that he's worked on, he wasn't only a director, but he was also a writer on them. So he's great at creating new IP. Um, but we also believe in IP from anywhere. So we are right now bringing in additional directors into our studio who are bringing in their own ideas as well and developing um, ideas from existing people within our team. So we look for IP anywhere. But in terms of deciding which one gets greenlit, that's um, first, I, first and foremost, I trust Eric's creative judgment as our chief creative officer. So I'm like, hey, do you feel like this has artistic legs? And then we also talk very much with Kane Lee, who's our head of content. And it's important for him to agree because he has a really good sense of what audiences will respond to. We create uh, four quadrant, you know, appealing experiences um, across the board, not just towards one specific segment. So he has a great um, sense of what will be franchisable <laughs> and appeal to a, as large of an audience as possible. And of course, for Larry, heading up all production and technology tells us whether or not we're crazy and whether or not it's even possible to do. But most of the time he's like, it's crazy, but We'll figure it out, which is why Larry is so amazing. So Larry, you ever, crazy. you ever say we'll figure it out and then go home and you know say what start are they crying? Doing? Yeah, <laughs> all the time. I mean, I think that's one of the fun things about about our our culture and 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 
being a startup is is that we get to do things that haven't been done before. We get to take on ambitious projects that um, you know that others might shy away from. And uh, you know, as 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 long as we can be flexible, and we you know we've we have a great set of people who are problem solvers, and that you know is very much the ethos that I think you know all of us, and especially you know Eric and myself in the early days in CG kind of felt that same way, where you don't always know what you're doing, but if you have the right people who are great problem solvers, then you'll sort of solve whatever problems to make sure that the stories we're telling you know become are the best that they can be. Right. You know, I'm, uh, one of the things about the, the series of films is there's very strong art direction in it. There's very interesting, somewhat different looks to all of them. This last one most especially had this like, this flat earth, at least at the, you know, at, at the front and back end, and was really nice, almost like a diorama uh, that belayed the 3D process, you know, it was kind of in, in contrast to it in a good way. Have you guys thought about trying to do one traditionally? I mean, with the traditional technology drawn and then somehow worked it into this? I don't know if, it, I know that, uh, you know, there's been some attempts at that. Um, is there, is it even possible? Do you think, Larry, is it possible? Well, I was gonna, I was gonna say, interestingly, so Bobby Yaga really, we did want to have this very theatrical stagecraft uh, yeah. look to it, a storybook look, and in fact, you know, the beginning and the end, the prologue and the epilogue are really meant to be like a pop-up storybook, but all the way in 360. We just thought that that would be something that both in a 2D version would really play well, and as well as in the th in the 360 VR version. But what's interesting is that we actually, when we started doing a lot of like the effects work, for example, it didn't fit in like sort of CG effects didn't fit into that world. Mm -hmm. And so we are lucky enough to have animators that are really flexible and are both right. CG animators, but also 2D animators. And so most of our effects are actually traditionally 2D uh, hand animated effects that we actually then put into sprites that are that are actually being rendered. So yes, it is definitely possible. I'm, I'm we, we also like leaned into you know, a little bit of a stop motion aesthetic as well, you know, by animating on twos sometimes and, and, and sort of almost treating our character, giving our characters kind of a little stop motion puppet look. No, no um, not that much blur, more, more of the uh, hard edge thing, which I like. Yeah, and blur is actually, um, you know, an expensive effect that gets added on. And when you're creating stuff in real time where you have to create um, an image and, milliseconds yeah. um anything that you can strip away and kind of get at the essence uh of what it is you're trying to communicate um the better it just gives, gives you more ones and zeros that you can use somewhere else well i i also thought in, in, in putting that question together was you guys ever going to try to do a stop motion one is it you know remember the good old popeye 3d stage from that from your childhood era when you watch it on tv what 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 is that when you those effects but uh any any work with a with that kind of uh, idea as well, or maybe just wondering. Probably no. <laughs> I, well, I, I missed the first part of your question. You so sorry. Try to do a stop frame uh, this way. Say that one more time. In stop action, would you like to do a stop motion? Oh yeah. You know. Um, yeah, I you know I think that that um, you know literal or traditional stop motion would be would be a little more would be more more and more difficult to the degree that you needed your your characters to respond to what the viewer was doing on the fly right mm -hmm. so that everything would have to be in the can and you'd have to be prepared to go in whatever direction made sense you'd have to have all those assets and account for all the different possibilities um but when, you, when you're actually just generating that stuff on the fly and you have a little bit of AI built in so that characters can respond in a natural way, you don't have to create those assets ahead of time. You just have an algorithm that's ready, waiting. It's like, oh, I'm up, you know, get, that, get her to look the right way, you know, or, or get the character to move up from there to over there. And it, and it all happens automatically. You know, the challenge, of course, is to do that and do it in a way that doesn't, where the character suddenly doesn't turn into a robot, you know, and, and so our, our engineering team um, kind of had to like 
come way into animation world and understand like, oh, if I'm gonna do this automatically, it can't just start to move, it's got to anticipate and it's got to have a little squash and stretch, you know, and it's got to have some acceleration. And then when it gets where it needs to be, it's got to like overlap and react and settle and all those things that an animator knows about. So the animator would give the engineer all these, all this information that the engineer can build into their algorithm and vice versa, the engineer can say to the animator, you know, in order to do this, I, you know, I'm going to need this and that and the other thing. And the animator can say, well, I can give you these little snippets of, of, um, of animation that you can use to integrate into your algorithm to make sure that, that you have everything you need. So it was a really um, interesting collaboration um, so that when we made that handoff between canned animation and, and AI driven animation, um, that it felt natural and the characters remained the same character that we met when we first met them. That's really interesting. And in, in a way that kind of answers in an interesting philosophical way, the question about your pipeline there's a pipeline that's an animation pipeline and a pipeline that's a real time pipeline. You've got to match those things together so you can do what you want, which is involve the audience who in a normal picture is sitting and watching into the story itself. That's pretty interesting. I have another question. I noticed that this was done in, in collaboration with the UN and with another group, I've forgotten the name of it, a, 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 a sustainable group, I think I wrote it down can't find it now. Conservation yeah. International. That's the one. Um, so how did that happen? Did they bring this to you? Did you have this story and bring it to them? Or was it another happy accident of Chinese New Year? <laughs> well, a lot of our projects have and pieces have social themes to them. For example, uh, Crow the Legend was about inclusion, right? That's why we had John Legend, Oprah, Diego Luna, Constitute, like all all across the spectrum because we felt it was important to have different perspectives, but it was based off of a Native American tale. And so we had, we partnered with Native Americans and philanthropy to make sure that we got the story correct and, and pay tribute to the actual origins and roots of the story, as well as bringing in Native American voice actors. Um, so for that one, we had partnered with Native Americans and philanthropy. Um, for this piece, because there's such strong themes of environmentalism and female empowerment, we thought, hey, who should we partner with uh, to make sure that we get this right? So we partnered, we reached out to the UN and uh, they were really excited about the project as well because they have this um, program that they're launching called Act Now, an Act Now campaign, which is an app that you can actually download and it, when you download, you can learn about different subjects and it teaches you how you can act now to actually impact that issue for um, especially environmentalism. So mm -hmm. the one that we are part of is um, about forests and deforestation. So it's um, Baba Yaga themed throughout and, uh, and it has Magda and the different characters there basically teaching you about deforestation and telling you exactly what it is that you can do to help and getting you to act. So that was just really exciting for us to be a part of, to actually create change, not only create for that inspire people to want to change, but then giving them this exact ways in which they can act and, and create change. Um, and in case you're curious, for the environmental angle for um, Baba Yaga, it is about uh, the witch who seems like an evil witch in the forest but over time you realize she's just protecting nature, right? right? And you are part of the villagers. And the question is who's really the bad one when the villagers are hacking down the forest, but she's like being mean back to you. And it's a struggle between humanity and the forest. And ultimately the decisions that you make determine whether or not humanity and nature can live in harmony versus if it's a zero sum game and only one of them can win. Right. So that's the role that you play in the piece. In the, in the, in the film, it comes through pretty, um, pretty substantially throughout. I mean, by the end, you, I mean, you could just enjoy it as a, as a film and say, oh, it's an adventure film and there's a witch in it and she's really good and all that. I don't <laughs> want to give away any spoilers. But, um, <laughs> but at the same time, at least for my experience watching it, was, oh, this is, you know, about, this is a sustainability film. This is not just an adventure to save mom. It's a sustainability film. It comes through pretty clearly. So. And, and, and you know when I saw the uh, um, uh, the legend film, I the, I thought the same thing. This was about inclusion and people believing in stuff, and and they're all they all both of them have some self sacrifice as well in there. It, it ain't easy to do these things. So, mm -hmm. 
So uh, I want to tell, I, I just a couple more questions. First of all, it's your birthday. So you had a, did you have a party? Did you have a cake? We, we, ha we didn't have a cake. We had champagne. Oh. Um, our, our amazing um, uh, exec admin, she and producers created this massive, amazing holiday plan where she mailed to each one, each of us like a hoodie and also sh some champagne. And we all first went into VR together and had a virtual party in mm -hmm. VR. Oh. And then um, after having that, it, and it was within the Baba Yaga environment that they secretly surprisingly built so that we are all in the world of Baba Yaga mm -hmm. and we create our own little avatars. And then afterwards we got together on Zoom to um, do superlative awards, like most likely to whatever. And it was really fun. And we were like cheersing. Oh, you, did you guys get special awards? It's like kind of like high school where they, you know, <laughs> most popular most uh gregarious so did you it was it was the, the chloe awards oh the chloe awards so did you get an award guys did you get some awards? we all we everyone all got, got an award, an award. <laughs> a, we're inclusive so and to, yeah, all yeah. the themes of our stories we it'd be awful if so if there's like one person who doesn't get an award yeah, <laughs> yeah the best the best didn't get an award award um yeah. you want to tell us what your awards were hmm? Hmm? my award was um was uh, for best landline because <laughs> I'm probably the only person that's old enough at Bam Bam to still have a landline. So I'm in the, all these Zoom meetings and my landline starts ringing. I go, oh, hold on, I gotta go get my phone and, and turn it, you know, and stop, the, stop it from ringing. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah there it is. Yeah, yeah we yeah. should call each other on our landline sometime. Yeah, we could, it's still <laughs> very clear, they're very clear, so. <laughs> Uh, what about years later? What was your what was your? I got the uh, the most intimidating because I'm <laughs> I am I am so uh, intimidating to all of all of my coworkers and Marine likes to be like, you should be intimidated by Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and Marine, did you so, get like the uh, what, what what did what award did you get? I don't remember. I remember the original award is. Um, multitasker in the middle of the meeting because I don't pay attention to what's going on the meeting and start multitasking. But I think it came out to something else. I will find it and tell you because mm -hmm. uh, I got to preview everybody's ahead of time and that one stood out, but I, I will you find out. Your, the whole crew was in, everybody who works at the studio was there. How about any of the voice actors? Do you have any voice actors show up? Because one of the things about Joe, you get some and freaking talent, big big name talent to do voices for you. John Legend, Oprah, you know, this Kate Winslet is in this one, you know. So uh, how does that happen? Do they do they find you? Do you find them? Do you do you show them well, the stuff you've done in the past and say, you want to be in one of these? One amazing thing is that um, they don't, we are an indie startup of 20 people. So we don't have a lot of money. <laughs> to pay anybody. So most of them are doing this just purely out of path. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is trusting in Eric, you know, Eric having directed all the Madagascar films and, and Ants has worked with some amazing talent, right? You know, Alec Wald, Baldwin and Stone, like just so many people. And so they feel safe for mm -hmm. sure with Eric, but they're just really excited about the stories that we're talking about. And oftentimes also about the social messages that we have, mm -hmm. like for Oprah, the diversity piece was very important to her. And it's one of the reasons why we created a 2D version as well as a VR version, because we knew that the 2D version would allow as many people to see it as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, we just propose it to them and they just get really excited about it. And they're willing to do a lot because they get so passionate about it. And for John, especially like didn't only, you know, voice act, he also wrote a song for us and he, he wanted to be executive producer and then he helped us with all the creative notes too. And our latest piece um, with Baba Yaga for, with Jennifer Hudson as um, an executive producer with Kate Winslet, Daisy Ridley and Glenn Close. Um, they've been amazing to work with as well. And in terms of whether or not they can party with us to answer mm -hmm. that question, we are actually having a virtual premiere of oh, the VR piece yeah. and there will be cast members coming to that piece. Cool. Um, and so we're all going to be in this environment together to, to celebrate. So it's pretty exciting. Now, um, you, you did mention this in, in, uh, in a little earlier, but there's 
I know you've got plans after this film. You probably got another. I think I, I read something about the next film is already in in uh, getting ready, uh, and you probably have other films. What? And I know there's some idea about you mentioned doing books. Um, so what is what are some of the plans you can talk about? Don't talk about anything in our lab talk. Yeah. Well, we have announced um, already a multi-book series um, with uh, Penguin Random House. And we've mm -hmm. also announced a graphic novel, multi-graphic multi novel book series with Macmillan as well and for her second books. So we're really excited about those series. Um, from the confidentially, we have a first look deal with somebody that I can't say. <laughs> the big six <laughs> for our- Confidential. Yeah. Yeah. for our IP to become feature films. Um, and then we've also signed um, several series uh, with streamers <laughs> that we will announce soon as well. So, so um, television series for broadcast? Yes, okay. uh, with streamers. And so it's, it's very exciting because we didn't set out to do this like so quickly. It's, there was just such demand for our IP um, most of which so far Eric has, you know, made is <laughs> amazing. And he, there's just such hunger for a lot of the um, amazing stories and characters that Eric has created. But in addition to that, we're bringing on additional directors into our studio with even more stories. So it's a very exciting time for us. Um, and we're just super honored by all the, you know, incoming like partnership with, with different people and all the interest in, in our IP. After five years, you're really moving along pretty well. You deserve everything you get and more. Thank um, you. It's a nice company. It's uh, got heart, which is a good thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I think that we'll wrap it. Um, and now we'll just look to the future. And the, the picture releases soon, right? Baba Yaga, Baba Yaga releases pretty soon. Uh, yes, next. in early January. So Q1. I've, seen the, I've seen the rough cut, which I thought was terrific. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, Maureen. Appreciate Thanks, it very Eric, much. So much. Um, this is where we all say so long and the no fade out. It just stops. So see you. Thanks, guys. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so much.